question number 180. 180, stand with me if you sing. Stand on the promises. 180.
It's going to be in a small three ring binder. It's going to have everybody's pictures, everybody's phone numbers, birthdays, and there will be a church calendar in the back of it. So, but as always, the church calendar is fluid. So just bear with us. All right, we have some birthdays this month. Speaking of Brother Ron, he had a birthday back on the 2nd. Mr. Paul has a birthday on the 19th, and we missed one. But I called Kevin and found out that Monday is his birthday on the 27th. Uh -oh. He's 18. He wouldn't admit how old he was, so he's just he's going to be 18 again. What's even funnier is my dad's birthday is on Monday. But he's, he's going down that Egyptian river, do you know? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's sing happy birthday to these. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday.
part of the service. <laughs> then he'll come and we'll receive the offering. The Bible says we're supposed to give joyfully, hilariously. Thank you. 
And so I, I, I want to say thank you to, to Ms. Tara and I and the, and the whole family. Much appreciated after they figured out who you were. And uh, I, supposedly I have family around 11, so I don't know. I guess I got to go try to find them. And, uh, but anyway, so we see Mary and Joseph being obedient. They had been taught from childhood what they were to do under Jewish law and Jewish custom. And they were obedient unto that very thing, which is why they were where they were when they were with Jesus as a child. And then in the second part of verse 43, we find that he goes missing. Well, he wasn't really missing. He knew where he was. But they didn't know where he was. I still remember as a young boy, Mom told me not to go over and play on the Crystal Flash ball diamond after a big rain it had flooded. Well, that lasted about two minutes. And I remember to this day, and that was well over 40 years ago, I remember swimming on the basketball court and trying to surf on a piece of wood that was out there. On the basketball court. That tells you how much water was out there. But man, when my mom yelled my name, that was not pleasant. And I still remember her just banging my backside on the, on the way home, and she would walk me in the water with the fly. <laughs> I wasn't laughing back then. I can laugh about it now, you know, all these years later. But obedience is a key to the Christian life. And we see Mary and Joseph being obedient to, to the, their father, and then we see Jesus who's gone missing. I mean, there's been times in our house where, where Jonathan's been quiet and it's like, where is he? Because we all know a quiet child is a child that's fixing to get in trouble. They're up to something, right? I can say that from experience. Because if I was being quiet, I didn't want anybody to know what I was doing. And so they couldn't find him. So they began to look for him. They thought that, they, that he was probably in the caravan with their family. So we see in verses 44 and 45 that they supposing him to have been in the company when a day's journey they kept going and they sought him among his kinfolk and acquaintance and when they had found him not they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. Whoops. I thought you had him. Well, I thought you had him. My dad was telling us the story the other day that uh, I didn't realize it but his dad, my grandpa, used to be a bus driver in Pittsburgh. And, the, and they couldn't find him. My dad was the oldest, and he was always in trouble. Just ask him. He'll tell you. And they couldn't find my dad. They looked everywhere. Well, he was out on Grandpa's bus asleep. And I, obviously, it's a vast difference from what they found Jesus doing. But, but to not be able to find your child, how? How? I mean, what a nightmare they, they were experiencing. That they were mistaken about where he was. And then in verses 46 to 48, we find out what he was doing. The Bible tells us that it came to pass that after three, day, three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to them, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Why did you do this to me? I can hear my mom say in the next. Just like a mom. But you see, they 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 had they were mistaken. They were misunderstood. He was misunderstood. He was in the middle of the doctors and the teachers. I mean the teachers of the law. The men who, who were required to know the law inside out, upside down, forward and backward. And Jesus at 12 years old was sitting in the midst of these of the quote unquote religious elite and they were sitting there amazed at a 12 year old boy who was probably tying them up in spiritual knots because not only did he know the law he is the living word of God and then we see in verse 49 the misunderstood purpose you know, he, and he said unto them, and she, he said unto them, how is it that she sought me? Wished ye not that I must be about my father's business? I mean, they knew that Jesus was sent from God, that Mary was a chosen vessel to bring Messiah into the world. Yet, even 
12 years later, they were misunderstood about the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, we know that he, the Bible tells us he, that he came to seek and to save that which was lost in Luke 19.10. And, and we're also told in the Bible that he came to, to minister, not to be ministered unto, to give his life a ransom for many. And so they misunderstood his purpose. But my point here is, when they came back and they found Jesus, they found him in the midst of the people. I don't know what you're facing today. I only know what we're facing. But it doesn't matter what we're facing, no matter how bad things look. But I can tell you with authority that Jesus is in the midst. Remember those three Hebrew young men in the book of Daniel chapter 3? Boy, Nebuchadnezzar got so mad, even his countenance changed. He was angry. Why? Because they wouldn't follow his order. What did he do? They heated the furnace seven times hotter than it was normally heated, and they cast those three men into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. It was so hot that the men that threw them in there were killed when they did it. And yet, what did, they, what did he say when he looked down in there? Didn't we throw three of them fellers in there? Yep, there's four in there now. And Daniel tells us the four was as the Son of God. There is Jesus. And so we find him in the middle of those in the temple ministering to the religious leaders. Why? Because they needed him. Just like you and I today need him. Look over at Mark chapter 1 this morning. Mark chapter 1. I said we're going to, we're going to move through the, through the gospel this morning. Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1 verse 9. Mark chapter 1 and verse 9. The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John and Jordan. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit, like a dove, descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so we, we find here John the Baptist in the wilderness. And what is he doing? He's preaching. He, he's preaching the message that there was one coming that people needed to pay attention to. He even goes so far as to say the one coming, he is not even worthy to bow down and loosen his sandals on his feet. And so we see, first of all, in verses 1 to 3, we see the message from John. His message was repentance, that turning from sin to God. And by the way, if, that, if you do not have all of that, you do not have genuine repentance. It's not enough just to turn away from sin, but as we turn away from sin, we must turn to God. That is Bible repentance. And that was John's message in verses 1 to 3 here in, in uh, Mark chapter 1. And then in verses 4 through 8, we see the messenger. The Bible tells us, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. And John clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of skin about his loins. And he did eat locusts and wild honey and preached, saying, There, is one come, there cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and then loose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That was John's message, the message of salvation to the Jews. We are still today called to be messengers. We have a message not only for the Jews, but for the Gentiles also. Thank God that the gospel went to the Gentiles. Why? Because that's us. We're Gentiles. And so we see the messenger. In verses 9 and 10, we, we see the man Jesus. He came to be baptized. I love it when people tell me he has to be baptized to be saved. 
because this is one of the one of the places I'd like to take them. Are you telling me that Jesus had to be baptized to be saved? He set an example for you and I to follow. He is the supreme example. What he did, we should do. And so he comes and he's baptized, setting the example for all those who would come after. And then we, in verse 11, we hear the message from heaven. God descended like a dove from heaven and a voice saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Is he well pleased with you and I this morning? But here at his baptism, we find Jesus. There is Jesus. Once again, in the midst of the people. Turn over to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Verse 1. The Bible says, In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called, and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins of peace. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but knew that the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man in the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. This is not fermented wine. People who tell you that Jesus condones alcoholic drinking are wrong. They're justifying their own sin. The best way to explain this is this was grape juice. It is the pure blood of the grape. This is exactly what Jesus did. This is his first miracle and I love it. He speaks to his mother and basically he says, my time has not yet come. So what does she do? She turns to the men and says, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. I can hear my mom saying that. Bless her heart. But we see here, we see the wedding in verses 1 to 5. I mean, this is, this is a great occasion that Jesus and the disciples had been, had been invited to. And Jesus knew what was going to take place when he got there. He knew this was the beginning of his miracles and that, uh, that his ministry was beginning here. And so they, they went and he performed the miracle. And the Bible tells us that then the disciples believed on him. I think that was an interesting statement. I, sometime I need to take some extra time and, and study that out a little, little more in depth. But here we have at the wedding, we have Jesus at the wedding. Then we see the water in verses 6 to 7. They brought those six pots and they filled them with water. They knew that it was just half water. <coughs> and then verses 8 to 11, we see the wine or the, the grape juice. Jesus performed this great miracle. But there again, there was a great need and a great, great day, this wedding in Canaan. And there was Jesus. And he performed a miracle and did what no man could do. Turn back over to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We're going somewhere. See how we're going all over the New Testament this morning. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, we'll 
start with uh, verse 18. The Bible says, While he spake these things unto them, behold, there came a certain ruler and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is even now dead, but come and lay thy hand upon her, and she shall live. And Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood twelve years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. And she said within herself, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned to him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort, thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the minstrels and the people making a noise, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn. But when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And the fame thereof went abroad into all the land. And so we see here this, this ruler comes to Jesus. Why? Because he is in distress. His dear daughter is laid dead at home and he doesn't know what else to do. So many times you and I find ourselves at a place in life where we feel like we're just our backs against the wall. We don't know which way to turn. We look up, we look down, we look around and like Joe, we can't discern that he's there. But he is there. He is in the midst with us. Right there is Jesus. And so this ruler comes to Jesus and, and tells him of his daughter who has died. And, and I think it's interesting that right in the middle of this, as Jesus is going, we find this account of a woman with an issue of blood. Twelve years she fought this. Twelve years this issue of blood. And what does she say? She says, if I could but just touch the hem of his garment, I can be made whole. The faith that this woman has. Unfortunately, we put some of us to shame, I'm afraid, today. We, we so often tend to walk by sight when we should be walking by faith. But we see that just by touching the hem of his garment, this woman is healed. And then in verse 23, we see Jesus arrives at the house. And I think it's interesting that, that there, is such, there is such mourning and such things going on in the house that Jesus has to basically say, move out of the way. Let me through. Boy, I've been there done that. And he made his way in. And, and the Bible tells us here in, uh, in verse 24, he said unto them, Give place, for the maid is not dead, but sleepeth. What was their response? They laughed him to scorn. Church, the world has no regard for Jesus or his message. We need to not think it strange as we carry the gospel of Jesus to a world that needs it when they laugh us to scorn. They did it to him. They'll do it to us. And then in verse 25, that when the people were put forth, he went in and took her by the hand, and the maid arose. And so we see that we see the noise of the of the mourning and the weeping. We see that he puts the people forth. And then verses 25 and 26, we see the healing that came. Why? Because this father had put his faith in Jesus and called him and brought him to raise his daughter from the dead. And there was Jesus in the midst. And then lastly, let's look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Starting with verse 33, the Bible tells us, And when they were coming to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there, and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads, and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. 
Likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others himself, he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe. You see, they, they knew of Jesus, but they didn't know him. I shared with, with someone earlier this week via an, an email. They were talking about someone that, uh, that I had been trying to witness to for a number of years. And this person told me, said, well, well they, they believe. And I said, here's the thing. They believe about Jesus, but they have not believed in him. They have not placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. And so that was that was a bit of a revelation to this person. And so I continue to pray for this individual that one, that one day the Holy Spirit will get this individual's attention and they'll come to the realization that they need Jesus Christ. But here we have, on the darkest day in human history, we have Jesus hung on a cross between heaven and earth dying for the sin of the world because he was the only sinless, spotless lamb who could pay a debt he did not owe. Hanging there, bearing the sin of the world, there was Jesus. And he did it all for you and I. We see in, in verse 33, the place, well, not the, the place of the skull. Then we see the crucifixion process. And my, what a process it is. That gall that they tried to give him was, uh, was a... Uh, well, my mind was a, It would relax the body and it would hasten suffocation. They were trying to drug him so that his body would relax and he couldn't raise up on the nails to catch his breath. And that was just part of that process. Not only was Jesus crucified, but we know that there were two thieves that were crucified with him in verse 38. And we know that the one rejected him, yet the other one, the other one received him that day. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Not only were there two thieves, but then we see in verses 39 to 45, we see the doubters. He saved others himself he cannot save. And yet we know that he could have. And then in verses 46 to 54, we see the awful death. There, in the midst of an angry, yelling mob, was Jesus hanging in the midst. And you can go all through the Word of God, church, just like Daniel chapter 3, you, you find him in that burning, fiery furnace with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, or with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or if you prefer their Hebrew names, Hanani, Azariah, Mishael. He's in the midst with them. How about the Apostle Peter? In, when they saw Jesus walking on the water, they thought it was a spirit, and then he spoke to them, and then they decided it was him. What did he tell Peter? Come on out. What did Peter do? Stepped out on the water. I believe that water stood up like concrete when he stepped out of the boat. Peter got his eyes off the Lord Jesus Christ, and what happened? He began to sing. I think he, I, I believe he screamed like a little girl, Lord, save me! What did Jesus do? Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and raised him up. There was Jesus in the midst, in the midst of the storm, in the midst of a life crisis that Peter was facing. I don't know what you're facing today, friends, but I can promise you this. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, he's in the midst with you. Just like our, our burden on the wall. Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. That word amen means so let it be. That check has been written and we can cash it at any moment. It is as good as the word of God. And again, in Hebrews, he tells us, I will never leave thee. So this morning, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what your needs are. But maybe you need God to show up in your life this morning. <coughs> maybe you need to come and pray this morning. Maybe uh, there's a burden. Maybe you have uh, someone that you need to pray for. The altar is open. 
I'm going to ask Brother Brown, Sister Debbie, to come and have a song of invitation this morning. This invitation is for you. If you need to come this morning, you come. Stand your feet, heads bowed, and eyes closed. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. Thank you for the Word of God. And I just want to praise you and thank you that no matter what we do, where we go, what we experience, that you're in the midst with us. God, I pray that you have your own way in this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen.